This video is sponsored by Raycon. Oh, sweet Mother Gaia. Her voice swung quickly to realization. Jameson, will you please phone up Clara Gonzalez over on the Catalina Baby? Tell her that her goddamn boyfriend has misplaced another of his dittos and he better come pick it up right now. I tried to smile, to thank her, but scheduled expiration could no longer be delayed. My pseudo ligaments chose that very moment to dissolve all at once. Time to fall apart. I don't remember anything after that, but I'm told that my head rolled to a stop just short of an ice chest where champagne was chilling. Some dinner guest was good enough to toss it inside next to a very nice bottle of Dom Perignon 38. Hello my beautiful watchers. Today I'm spotlighting another science fiction novel that got me into the genre. Kiln people, often mispronounced killing people, which I assume was intentional, though the pun doesn't exactly make sense as this book isn't particularly killing orientated, is a 2002 science fiction novel by David Brim, who, in addition to being an author, is also a scientist and NASA consultant. Other notable works of his include the Uplift Universe books and The Postman, Yes, the one that was turned into the Kevin Costner movie, but that wasn't his fault. At its core, Kiln People is a private eye mystery novel, but with the huge twist that there are four main characters and they are all the same person. You see, in the not too distant future, human society has been drastically altered by an unexpected revolutionary technology breakthrough. The ability to cheaply create temporary copies of oneself out of a futuristic clay substance. These copies are referred to by a bunch of different names, golems, dittos, facsimile, and there's a bunch of shorthand names for real person as well. What happens is a machine does a super intense scan of your body and mind and copies your brain waveform into the artificial brain of the golem with the intention of transferring your complete life experience and personality. The result is, hopefully, a reasonably close copy of you, allowing you to do twice as much work or any other task that you have to do in a day. At any time, you can both plug yourselves back into the machine and upload the Ditto's experiences back into your human brain. The problem is they have very short lifespans. They don't have any way of generating any more energy than was initially imbued into them because they don't have complex organs that can convert food and you can't just plug flesh even pseudo flesh into a wall socket and charge them up. The result is they only last for about 24 hours before the enzymes in their bodies start to break down and they completely dissolve. Even if this starts before they make it back to you, as long as you at least get the head back in time, you can still upload the memories, though a lot of people choose not to do this so they don't have to relive the experience of their body breaking down around them. The complexity and capabilities of the body you copy yourself into are varied depending on the cost of the blanks you buy. The standard models are color-coded to make them easy to tell which is which and to make them easily differentiable from humans. The cheapest models are green, which are the basic utility design. Limited thinking power, smooth features, no additional abilities to speak of. This is the ditto you make for manual labor and menial tasks like doing housework. Then you have the greys, which are baseline reasonably close to being one-for-one -one human and have more customizable features than greens. You can add night vision or the ability to hold one's breath for hours. Then there are the ebony jet black golems that have been designed to have perfect mental focus and some enhanced intelligence. These are the guys you create when you have a problem to solve or your job involves a lot of data shifting. Then there's the all-time bestsellers, ivory dittos, which are the pleasure models. Because of course, one of the first questions that mankind asks about any new piece of technology is, can I fuck it? They also have, uh, enhancements. Incidentally, sex with dittos isn't often considered to be real sex, more like using a sex toy, so getting someone to send you a copy of themselves to bonk is considered more like a subscription to an OnlyFans page than actual prostitution. If you have the kind of mind that can handle it, you can use bodies that aren't even remotely humanoid. You could be a T-Rex shaped combat model or a little weasel sized creature for reaching small places a human wouldn't fit. Very amusingly, the most coveted job in this world has become bus driver because buses are giant monsters who carry people around cities and, well, who wouldn't want to be a kaiju for a living? Now, obviously, this has had a massive effect on, well, everything. The work economy, first and foremost. A business owner might not have to hire any employees. He can simply make copies and do all the work himself. Or, if it's a specialist job, you can always hire the best person in any city, as they're always going to be available no matter how many jobs they have on the go. Bryn doesn't go into the complete history, but he does reference a lot of upheaval and a stressful transition period getting used to this new way of living. Civil unrest and civil wars that were very narrowly avoided. The book takes 
place in that sweet spot where the world has ironed out a lot of the kinks, but there's still enough residual mentality from the before times that the characters feel relatable. The world hasn't been changed beyond recognition yet. The result, predictably, is the vast majority of the world filing for unemployment benefits. In the country of the story setting, it's referred to as the Purple Wage. It's not all bad, it seems to allow for a pretty comfortable, if not extravagant existence, so the biggest issue that affects people day to day is boredom. This is countered by people utilising golems for increasingly weird and fanatical hobbies. Obviously sex, but also gladiatorial death matches, which are considered to be a fun way to spend an evening. Another notable drawback of living the ditto life lifestyle is, they're considered to be objects, not people. Despite them being fully sapient and able to feel pain, killing one is considered a finable misdemeanor at worst. When you go out in the world as a golem, you have to accept that all number of terrible things might happen to you and this will just not be considered to be a serious issue. So as you can imagine, with a whole group of beings with different color skin being considered property, the real life slavery parallels are unmissable and not ignored, but it's not treated as an exact allegory. You have to understand the mindset of people who use golems and of the golems themselves. They both have memories of being both. Everyone has had experience being the ruling class and the underclass, and unless they use a ton of golems every day, they spend a lot more time as the ruling class, so on the occasions that they are dittos, they naturally gravitate towards thinking of themselves as complex appliances. Of course, there's inevitably going to be occasions where that super sucks, say, if you've been didnapped and know that no one's going to bother trying to rescue you, plus, I can't imagine it's nice knowing anything that's done to you is going to be treated like... I don't know, they just cracked your creator's phone screen. This and the other things that make up the mentality of the Dittos are a huge part of why I found this book so interesting. A large part of the story is told from the perspective of beings that know that they are objects and keenly aware that they are very, very temporary. I mean, of course, at the end of the day, humans are temporary too, but most of us at least don't know that we have an expiration date tomorrow. Many golems try to avoid the existential dread that would understandably come with this permanent imminent mortality by believing in an afterlife, which is a misleading term as it's slightly more practical than a theologic or spiritual hope. They convince themselves that they are just temporarily disconnected parts of the original soul, and if they can make it back to their human and upload their memories, they will be transferred back into him as well, living on as a single unit. Alternatively, it can actually have the opposite effect and make people pretty unconcerned with personal safety. As I said, blood sports make a big return. An interesting social dynamic occurs when the ditto of a powerful rich person meets the human form of someone who might otherwise be considered beneath them. Technically, as a human, the latter has superiority over the ditto, however, he probably wouldn't want to flex on the golem too much in case his original gets offended when he uploads the memories. Dittos can actually outlive their original if only by a day, sometimes allowing people to make their own funeral arrangements. So, that's the world. As for the plot, as I mentioned at the start, this is a story about a private investigator trying to solve a case. Albert Morris. He considers himself a pretty lucky man because he's one of the few people in the world still with gainful employment, and his brain is highly compatible with the copying process. Some people get mixed results regarding how much of their mind and personality can be passed into the golems, but Albert always gets a perfect download into everything from a greenie to a high-powered ebony. As is quite often the case in these sort of detective stories, the PI gets in way over his head in some scary stuff. A conspiracy that could potentially destroy the fragile balance the world has finally found after its paradigm shift. Albert usually implants his similes with the compulsive need to sub-vocally narrate their activities and thoughts, recording it onto a device located in their throats, so there's always a perfect record of every case they help him with that can be recovered even if they don't make it back to him before they dissolve. Basically, a black box, but for a person. The entire book is narrated in the first person, implying it's an archive of these records. They each uncover different parts of the mystery, so the reader is the only one who gets the full picture until right at the end. And you might think that would have the potential to get annoying, but I don't think it does, which is a testament to Bryn's ability as a writer. It's cleverly presented, so information isn't repeated enough times for it to get old, and none of the Alberts ever get too hung up on things that one of the others already know. The 
ending, um, I mean, I won't spoil it, but it gets a bit weird. Like, I guarantee you won't figure out where this shit is going before you get there. As far as the writing itself goes, I was constantly impressed by Bryn's ability to conjure very clear mental images with his words. It's all extremely concise, but you still get a feel for the world around the characters and their actions. The book's a little on the chonky side at 460 pages, but it's not egregious, and I think it's good enough to sustain engagement all the way through. So yeah, awesome concept, fascinating world, strong story. If you want something a little different, this book might be a fun read. And now, a quick word about our sponsor. As you might know, my beautiful watchers, there's few things that please me more than being able to throw on a good audiobook while I'm getting life stuff done, but I am a conscientious person. I don't want to subject people around me to potential spoilers by blasting this stuff out willy-nilly, so let me tell you about my favorite set of earbuds, Raycon Everyday E25s. If you go to buyraycon.com slash Dominic Noble or click the link in the description, you can get 15% off your order and it comes with a 45-day free returns guarantee. Enjoyed by music aficionados like Snoop Dogg and Melissa Etheridge, these bad boys come with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a compact design that sits comfortably and securely in your ear for peak noise isolation. They also come in a range of delightful colors. I chose black so they wouldn't clash with any shirt I wore. Yes, that's the kind of thing I think about, don't judge me. So yeah, if you're in the market for some legitimately really solid earbuds, buy Raycom.com slash Dominic Noble. 15% off, you won't regret it. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. If I could impose on you to do me the standard YouTube-related solids of liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing if you're new and enjoyed the content, and all those good things that keep channels from being consumed by the dreaded algorithm, I would be most grateful. Please take care of yourselves out there in these troubled times, and I will see you soon. Ditto, 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 I made it out of clay. And when it's dry and ready, things really get sexy. I can roam the city as a giant horny ape. Ditto, 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 just like the Pokemon. It can scrub my toilets or fight like Genghis Khan. Ditto, 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 I made it out of clay. Best thing about the ditto is it only lasts one day. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdloff, and Kat Harker. And a big thank you to Il Nedge for writing and performing this song. Check out his channel for more parody and original music. Okay, well, you done? Right, good luck. Good luck.